Hello everyone, it's Maha. I hope you're all doing really well. Welcome to the last part of the Minor Arcana series of Tarot and Astrology. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the remainder two mutable signs, Sagittarius and Pisces. And we're going to be looking at the Minor Arcana cards associated with these two signs, which are the uh, 8, 9, and 10 of the suit of wands and the suit of cups. So in the previous video we looked at uh, Gemini and Virgo, the mutable sign, air sign of Gemini and the mutable earth sign of Virgo. And then we're just going to look, uh, we're going to continue on and finish off the rest of the minor arcana cards. Woohoo! What a relief! Finally! So I'm just going to jump right in. With, we're going to begin with the fire sign of Sagittarius, the mutable fire sign, which corresponds us to the 8, 9, and 10 of wands. So Sagittarius links us to the temperance card. So we've got the suit of fire, number 8, 9, and 10 of wands, corresponding to the mutable signs, the three decans of Sagittarius, Sagittarius ruled by temperance, and um, Sagittarius is ruled by the planet Jupiter, which is the planet of expansion and good fortune, the wheel of fortune. So Sagittarius is the ruler of the ninth house, the ninth house of the higher mind, higher education, philosophy, and religion. Fire, the sign of Sagittarius, represents spiritual creative energy. And Sagittarius is active, being a mutable fire sign, very active and restless. It's the sign of movement and momentum. It's prone to excess, so this temperance card is very suitable, in my opinion, for Sagittarius, as it signifies uh, having a balance, moderation, uh, gives a warning uh, to Sagittarius sometimes of overindulgence. Sagittarius and Jupiter tend to overindulge. They can be a bit reckless sometimes, and there's a lot of restless energy, movement, momentum, these are all things that belong to Sagittarius. And these are all important to keep in mind as we explore the next three cards for the three decans of Sagittarius. So let's look at the first card, the Eight of Wands. And as we know, we have different visitors that are being hosted in each sign by the ruler of that sign. So the ruler of, sign, of the sign of Sagittarius, Jupiter, is now hosting a guest, and that guest is the first decan of Sagittarius. The guest is the magician. Mercury, Mercury in Sagittarius, is uh, our next corresponding energy here for the Eight of Wands. So Mercury, also known as Hermes, is the swift god of speed, thought, speech, and communication, as well as synchronicities, those momentary flashes of experience that we encounter when we contact meaningful coincidences in our lives. We looked at Gemini last time and how in Gemini, Mercury uh, makes connections. It's the aspect of the mind that collects information and makes those connections in the mind. It is uh, the planet of the mind. And in mythology, Hermes was the messenger god in Greek mythology. And he traveled in between worlds and could carry messages from gods to humans and from gods to gods. He was also the shapeshifter god who could enter the underworld and back one of the very few gods who could do that. It's interesting because in the mythic tarot, the temperance card is illustrated 
as the uh, as Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, and there's some Iris here in the Temperance card, and that's also uh, another messenger aspect that we have here being emphasized. Iris was the messenger goddess, so sort of the feminine counterpart to Hermes in that she was the bridge between the worlds and could also carry messages to humans from the gods. So one of the common interpretations of the Eight of Wands that we usually read about is about messages, messages that arrive quickly, messages moving quickly, right? And I think that relates us to the god, uh, the god Hermes and Mercury, that swift god who quickly message, uh, delivers messages. Corinne Kenner in Tarot and Astrology says, the Golden Dawn designers of this card called Mercury and Sagittarius the Lord of Swiftness because it depicts a hail of messages and communication flying through the air, soaring like the archer's arrows, connecting people and places to one another. So I think that's really, uh, really the, the main gist of this card and how Mercury, as the magician, comes through in the sign of Sagittarius Sagittarius is directly opposite of Gemini. Gemini, as we also talked about, is ruled by Mercury. And these two signs have something in common in that, like we always, we always talked about polarities, how they're not opposites, but they are, they are reaching the same thing, just in different ways. So whereas Mercury represents the mind, Sagittari in, in Gemini, Jupiter in Sagittarius is the higher mind where Mercury connects us to information, immediate information, Sagittarius gets the whole picture as the Wheel of Fortune card, so putting it all together. And, and how this relates to this card is that we have the general idea of mm, communication, the mind as a mean of means to communicate, and the, the, the capacity of the mind to make connections between things, between people, between situation and events, like what I, uh, when I said synchronicities, that kind of flash of insight where Mercury finds those connections, Sagittarius finds meaning into the connections. So here Mercury in Sagittarius gives, it, gives us even more of that idea of messages being delivered, of making connections. Mercury is an air planet and it has a very active energy. Like Hermes, the god of speed and thought, so uh, the lord of swiftness, like I just read from Corinne Kenner. And Sagittarius is a sign of movement and Sagittarius is mutable, mutable sign, mutable fire sign, it has a very active energy, so Mercury in this particular sign becomes even more active and forward moving. So Mercury in Sagittarius gives for a very uh, high active, highly active thinking mind, lots of things happening. The energy here in this particular decan, in the first decan, in the Eight of Wands, is movement, information, making connections, information coming, from all different angles and um, with a lot of speed. As well as we've seen before, Mercury in uh, Gemini and Virgo, which are both mutable signs, gives Mercury more of this active mind here in the mutable sign of Sagittarius. So as you can imagine, here there's a lot of movement in Sagittarius, which of course we can see in this card the combination of active moving energy of Mercury and the fiery mutable sign of Sagittarius. I'm going to read you a little bit here from the Holistic Tarot book by Benabel Wen. She says, this is a card about aiming and shooting. The Eight of Wands is the action card. It stands for clarity of thought and resoluteness in action. It also suggests that here is a great deal of buzz and activity to come. New ideas, remember, Mercury is the planet of the mind. New ideas will be highly promising. The card could also indicate the arrows of love fast approaching or a message or communication coming soon that will bring good news. So I think the good news can 
bring us back to here the wheel of fortune sort of a um, hidden message there so do you see how all of these astrologically and also visually connect us to the meanings that we read a lot of times in the different guidebooks i think that's really cool because with, when we know some language of astrology we can see all of that through the interpretations that we come across and i like how benabel when here says uh, the arrows she says it's about aiming and shooting and sagittarius of course is the half man half horse centaur is uh, that's holding a bow and arrow so i was reading in kim hajan's book the complete guide to the tarot Illum illuminati uh, about the myth of icarus in relation to the potential trap of this card i thought that was very a really nice metaphor for mercury being in detriment in the sign of sagittarius so as we said before uh, when a planet is in a sign opposite is home so in Gemini Mercury is at home in Sagittarius it is very very far away from home so it's said to be in detriment and I want to touch on that because I have touched on the idea of essential dignities throughout the series and I think looking at just uh, a few things about what an um, what a planet what Mercury being in detriment in Sagittarius can mean can maybe think maybe relate us to the shadow aspect of this cart and that's just an, an interesting way to look at it so uh, she talks about Kim Hajans she talks about how uh, in the myth Icarus was prisoned in a cave with his father and they came up with a clever idea to design a set of wings to help them escape but in the end Icarus became too proud of his own cleverness when he was flying up he thought he just became very proud that he could actually fly up so high so he decided to go up up really high close to the sun uh, regardless of his father's warnings not to get close to the uh, to the sun because his wings would melt because they were made um, from wax and so he didn't listen to his father he became too prideful and confident and then he just flew up and then came crashing down so Kim Hudgens relates this beautifully as a metaphor which gives us a warning about this card's potential blind spot and she says, I'll read you here, it's possible to set our ambitions so high that we get burnt along the way, exhausted from the energy they consume. When the Eight of Wands appears in a reading, it brings a swiftness to the entire situation. Fast movements and swift progress in all things is signified by this card and, is often su and it often suggests that the current is the kind of person that is always rushing around, always on the go, always doing something. So here we're reminded of that Sagittarian energy, right, that we just talked about earlier. And Mercury being the planet of speed and movement, being in the restless fire sign of Sagittarius, the mutable fire energy, can easily burn itself out from doing too much. Over exhaustion, that's like a typical uh, symptom of Sagittarius, doing too much, thinking too much here in this case, overextension. So this might be just one way of considering Mercury being in detriment in Sagittarius. Again, detriment doesn't mean weakness. It's simply just pointing us to some challenges to watch out for. And I love bringing uh, them in in these series because they can just help us to see the card in a slightly different way and enrich our meanings, our, our, our readings, and uh, possibly help us to come up with more insights when we do readings. At least this is from my personal experience, and hopefully it is true for you too. So next we have the Nine of Wands. We leave our Wheel of Fortune here. Let's see who our next visitor is. So we have the Nine of Wands as our next card in the second decan of Sagittarius. And our visitor here happens to be the Moon, the High Priestess. So we have High Priestess visiting Wheel of Fortune and Temperance in the second decan of Sagittarius. So. So the High Priestess, the Moon, and the Moon as we know from 
previous videos, is all about our emotions, our security, emotional security. It is also the symbol of mother, nurturing, caring, what we need to make us feel safe and protected in the world. The moon also speaks of the past, of memories, and the subconscious mind. It's also about reflection, going within, and also reflection on past memories and feelings. So here we see this young man, sort of in a guarded and protective position, seems to be maybe guarding his boundaries. He looks weary and has a bandage on his head. Um, it could show that he's wounded, which is sort of, I think, a perfect example of the wounded warrior that we have in the fire sign of Sagittarius. Uh, we have associations of the wounded warrior with Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is a sign of the archer, like I said, the half and half horse centaur, Chiron. Chiron was the wounded healer, also the wounded warrior. He was not a hero, he was the mentor and teacher of heroes, but he himself was a warrior, someone who's gone through tremendous hardship and has gained wisdom and experience and have, has had the courage to go through life and gain inner strength. Sagittarius, as I said, rules the ninth house, the house of philosophy, long distance travels, the higher mind, and it's a, it's a uh, fire sign, so it's highly intuitive. It's an adventurous sign, loves to travel. And here, the moon, speaking of the feminine energy, being about the emotions, is combined with the energy of Jupiter, the ruler of Sagittarius, which is uh, in Greek mythology, he's Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, and he is a very masculine type of energy. So here you have sort of a combination of all of those things here in this card. And I'm going to read you Corinne Kenner again from Tarot and Astrology and see what she has to say about this card in relation to the moon in Sagittarius and also what I've just discussed. And you hear Cheeky in the background, he's just having his dinner, so hopefully he's not being too distractive. Otherwise, I'm going to have to pause the video, but I'll read the paragraph here. Sagittarius is an explorer and an adventurer. But here, under the meditative influence of the moon, a soldier takes time to reflect on past missions and formulate plans for the next round of battle, as well as the next cycle of experience. And the moon, of course, is about the cycles, right? The Golden Dawn designers of this card call the moon in Sagittarius the Lord of Great Strength because of the calming power of the moon that gives Sagittarius the deep philosophical underpinnings he craves, especially when it comes to spiritual battle. The Sagittarian and lunar blend of emotion and reason, so like Jupiter, the masculine, the moon, feminine, the Sagittarian and Lunar brand of emotion and reason help us build a fortress of strength, resolve, and self-reliance. The wounded warrior must release the past in order to move forward. I thought that was a beautiful paragraph to sort of summarize everything that I just discussed previously in relation to visually just this card itself. Fiery Sagittarius loves to learn and teach. It's very expansive, expand, the planet of expansion. Jupiter is a planet of expansion. And loves to grow wiser and loves to find meaning in things and to become wiser, to grow and to share its wisdom. And I like this image from the Silvercraft, Silver Witchcraft tarot deck by Barbara Moore, where there's this man sitting uh, and there's a bonfire and there's people surrounding him and he's sort of the teacher here. So it's like a, this wise man sharing his wisdom to the people around the fire. In the guidebook, Barbara Moore says, 
that this fire is like a boundary of light helping us feel safe. Isn't that wonderful? That feeling of security that the moon gives, the idea of the boundaries that we talked about here, uh, the um, protection, and this feeling of safety that the moon provides is created by, by this fire here in this card, as Barbara Moore says. And in Holistic Tarot, Benema Wen, again, I'll read you a short paragraph from her. She says, the seeker feels like he or she is in a defensive, protective mode. He or she has to fight to defend his or her territory. Here, the Nine of Wands, here in the Nine of Wands, the character takes a conservative position, one resistant to change, and as a result, not able to achieve progress or expansion. So what Benevol Wen is referring to here is what may happen as a result of the shadow aspect of the moon playing out here, because the moon loves safety, not change. But Sagittarius, on the other hand, needs change in order to grow and expand. Sagittarius, as we know, is a mutable sign, and mutable signs are by nature flexible and can easily adapt to change. And they certainly don't like to feel stuck in any situation. So safety and security are not really uh, the most important things for Sagittarius opposite to the moon. In the complete guide to the tarot illuminati by Kim Hudgens, she advises us to use that adaptability of nature uh, of um, the nature of Sagittarius, the flexibility of Sagittarius as an asset in order to counteract the stuckness that our wounded warrior may be facing right now in this card. She says, the Knight of Wands can sometimes suggest that the best way to respond to the situation is to wait and see, conserve energy before acting in response rather than initiating action. They must be dedicated to flexibility and adaptability in this situation, as they will be able, able to respond with more strength and a firmer foundation because of it. So we've also discussed before that the moon and Sagittarius are both reactive, the moon being emotionally, react emotionally reactive and Sagittarius being a mutable fire sign susceptible to too much movement and overextension. And again, this is why the temperance card becomes so important here for Sagittarius as a lesson. So I think this piece of advice that she gave here, that uh, Kim Hudgens gave here, is really useful for the moon and Sagittarius in general. And I just wanted to end it here by talking about something that I came across the other day in a book that's completely unrelated to tarot. And I like to do that sometimes, just draw similarities between tarot and just life and things I come across. And it gave me some insights into this card in relation to the moon in Sagittarius. I wanted to share it with you. I wasn't really sure if I should because I didn't want to make this, the discussion of this card too long, but I think I might as well since I have it here. So um, the book is called Inner Bonding by Margaret Paul. And in the introduction section, she talks about her psychotherapy work that she calls intention therapy. So here is what she says about intention therapy. And I thought that was, that kind of resonated with, with everything that we looked at here. Intention therapy is based on the theory that there are only two basic intentions in life, the intent to protect, and the intent to learn. So that's interesting, right? Protect, being the moon, learn, being Sagittarius. So I'll continue. Most of us, especially when we feel discomfort, pain, or fear, have learned to protect against knowing about, experiencing, and taking responsibility for these feelings. We protect by disconnecting from these feelings in various ways. The intent to protect keeps us locked in behaving in ways that perpetuates the very fear and pain we are trying to avoid. We have another choice, that is, the choice to learn from our pain and fear and thus find ways out of these feelings. So, yeah, so the need to protect resonates with the moon, they need to learn with Sagittarius, and then the delineation of these two energies might mean the need to grow and learn from past experiences or the need to reflect on the past for the attainment of wisdom, right? That's, that's how I put it together. 
And so yeah, I'm gonna end it here on this card. Let's see, who's our next visitor? The next card is the Ten of Wands. Here we have Saturn as our visitor. Saturn, I always like to put the World card as well as the Devil card because I feel like these two cards together sort of encompass the energy of Saturn. Not just one or the other because the World card kind of represents that more the healthier or let's say the, the lessons of Saturn that we gain through hard work and then the devil is more like the shadow aspect of Saturn and also traditionally in traditional astrology Saturn is referred to as the great malefic planet so I think that here the the goat the goat god you can see the devil looks like a goat like the mountain goat as as a Capricorn sort of speaks to us in both cards I believe so uh, he's also Saturn, known as the Great Taskmaster, Father Time, or the Grim Reaper. Well, a lot of times when tra um, there's transits of Saturn throughout the chart, where it touches can indicate blocked energies. Some challenges maybe, or setbacks, frustrations, limitations of some kind, restrictions. Saturn can represent loss, fear, guilt, dissatisfaction, burdens, limitations. He's the one also who forces us to face reality no matter how harsh it may be and asks us to put in the hard work and as a result we gain wisdom from the experience, wisdom of old age, which is why he's also known as the old man and also we attain this kind of freedom that we have in the world card, this kind of completion of manifesting things in the physical world through hard work, through discipline, through commitment, integrity. The Saturn energy though is opposite to Jupiter. As we've talked about in some other videos, Jupiter, the ruler of Sagittarius, is very opposite energy to Saturn. Saturn wants to contract where Jupiter wants to expand. So two opposing energies. And we saw this earlier in the Two of Pentacles, if you remember, that Sagittarian energy, which is jovial, freedom-loving, independent, enthusiastic, optimistic. It does feel somehow oppressed or overburdened here by Saturn's heavy influence. Saturn rules in medical astrology the heavy metals or lead. So Corinne Kenner from Astrology and Tarot says, Saturn is the planet of gravity. When Saturn assumes the rulership of Sagittarius in the third decan, he brings the weight of the world with him. That's kind of a nice metaphor, right? Because I just said he's, he rules over heavy metals. He's like a heavy influence. And then um, in general from what he represents, and then the world card, she kind of puts that, that beautifully in there as uh, metaphorically, she says, he brings the world, the weight of the world with him. He tempers his dreams and hopes and limits in his travels. The young man might be carrying the burden of manifesting his dreams and ideas. Unfulfilled hopes weigh heavily on anyone's soul. He might also be struggling with guilt for past wrongdoings. The Golden Dawn designers of this card called Saturn in Sagittarius the Lord of Oppression. For anyone who's unfamiliar with Saturn's limits and restrictions, the weight of responsibility can certainly seem oppressing. I think that's really beautiful. That's kind of all we really need to say about this card, but of course I'm going to add more. So as we said earlier in the, in the Eight of Wands, Sagittarius is the sign of movement mutable fire sign, always on the go, always wanting to move. People with a lot of Sagittarius energy in their charts are very active people usually and they're also very passionate, fire energy, and they must learn really to temper that energy. So the temperance card, slowing down, paying attention, uh, paying attention to moderation in general. So Saturn, when it visits the sign of Sagittarius, it really brings a lot of hard game lessons for the free-spirited nature of Sagittarius. Of course, Sagittarius 
might find the energy to that kind of Saturn energy here to be overburdening him and not very enjoyable. But in the end, Saturn always promises success in our endeavors if we put the hard work in, like I said before. So if we cooperate, if we learn to work with the Saturn energy, which can be challenging sometimes, and if we work, if we learn to work with it, it can be hard, but it's always rewarding in the end, like the world card. And so Saturn teaches the mutable fire sign Sagittarius lessons of persistence. Saturn is very persistent. Uh, Capricorn is a very persistent sign. Think about the mountain goat as a, as a metaphor, how the mountain goat just keeps on climbing those hard rocks. And so um, the Sagittarius learns the Sagittarius energy, the lessons of persistence and tempering his energies to reach completion, gain wisdom from practical life experience. So really Sagittarius uh, appreciates that in the long run. In the creative tarot, Jessa Crispin gives us some insights into the challenging lessons Saturn brings here to Sagittarius. She says, the wands represent fire, everything that excites us and gives us pleasure, but too much excitement can lead to exhaustion and too much fire can lead to burnout. If we do not figure out how to ground ourselves, how to be practical rather than passionate, only passionate, we can sometimes run into trouble. Our health, might fail, we can lose our way. What was once vitally important to us becomes only a source of misery. Where we once dedicated ourselves wholeheartedly, we now turn away. If our passions are not made manageable, the temperance, we can't sustain our energy over long spans of time. We are forced to quit. The ton of wands can show up as a warning. Personally, I can definitely relate to what Jessica Crispin is saying here, being a Sagittarius with a lot of Sagittarius energy in my chart, and I know that as an artist, many years ago, I overworked myself way too much because I didn't know how to temper my creative, fiery energy, and I pushed myself over and beyond, beyond my own limits, and it resulted, unfortunately, in a series of physical injuries and health issues to the point that I had to stop working altogether. I had to put everything on hold and take a complete break to recover. So I really understand what she's talking about in this, in that statement she made. And then Jessa in her book also goes on to talk about how many artists actually end up sick or in some cases she says dead because they really haven't managed to balance this excited fire energy of passion. She ends her discussion about this card with this inquiry for us. She says, how does the trajectory of the wands, which starts off so promising, so exciting, end up in such a disappointing state? Which makes me think of the renowned astrologer Liz Green, who once said, creativity is both a gift and a burden. That, re that sentence really stuck to me. I never forget it. Creativity is both a gift and a burden. I think that kind of sums up this card for me, That just that sentence itself, that although the journey of the wands is filled with the passion and creativity of fire, it needs grounding and containment so that the fire doesn't burn itself out. And Saturn, being an Earth planet, very persistent, very solid, can be tapped into in a positive way in order to bring that grounding Earth energy necessary to contain an overabundance of fire. And that concludes my discussion for this uh, three, for this um, sign, Sagittarius, and also the suit of wands. So there we have it. Now we are moving on to the last mutable sign uh, which is the mutable water sign, Pisces. So the mutable water sign of Pisces corresponds to the moon card. And it is ruled by Neptune, which corresponds to the hanged man. And we have three cards 
the three minor arcana cards that correspond to the three decans of Pisces are the Eight of Cups, the Nine of Cups, and the Ten of Cups. And Pisces is traditionally ruled by Jupiter. So we have the for Wheel of Fortune as well. Now let's just talk a little bit about the energy that we're going to be experiencing in this next three decans for the next three cards. So Pisces is the highly sensitive, artistic, imaginative sign, watery sign. It's a mutable water sign, so it's highly emotional, prone to change and the emotions, right? Because mutable signs are about movement, so changing the emotions, the moods, just like the moon, which is also um, uh, reflective of our cycles, our emotional cycles. Pisces absorbs emotions and energies in the environment very easily. And Neptune also, the ruler of Pisces, is that nebulous planet that dissolves boundaries as we've talked about before. And Neptune is also the planet of fantasy, illusion, escapism, and the dream world. It's otherworldly, numinous, highly, highly spiritual. It is the planet of self-sacrifice, which is something we associate with the hangman, right? And the highest form of unconditional love is Neptune. We can see some of these images, right? That he's he looks like he's got light around his head, he's enlightened, he's just letting go. Those keywords, letting go, uh, self-sacrifice, uh, enlightenment, those keys that we, uh, keywords that we associate with Neptune resonate with this card for me. With Neptune, things it's, it's important to know that things are never clear. They're nebulous and hazy, just like we have with the Moon card. There could be some confusion sometimes with Neptune. Neptune loves to dissolve boundaries, as I said, and it does that in, in a way to escape reality, to go into the dream world, to the imagination, to be at one with the imagination world, to diffuse, diffuse from reality. And then Jupiter, as we saw before, is the god of expansion, and here in Pisces, which is the sign that it traditionally rules, he really shines and is really quite happy here. So Jupiter and Neptune both influence Pisces here. And so all of what I just mentioned points, just sort of points us to the next three cards and paints the backdrop for what we're going to be looking at as well. Also, Pisces rules the 12th house. And this is the house of the deep-seated emotions, the collective unconscious, and the ocean of imagination. This is where both the artist and the poet, the highly sensitive, highly imaginative, reside. Pisces is also a highly idealistic sign. It's the mystic of the zodiac. So just look at these images and think and see if any of what I'm what I'm saying, uh, any of which what I'm saying refers to these images. Pisces just highlights higher spiritual values, compassion, and Neptune as its ruler, representing unconditional love, plays out here. It uh, Pisces is said in the twelfth house to rule the world of music, fantasy, and escapism and then film and things like makeup artistry that create an illusion of reality also fall into this category. And also addictions and mental illness, madness, some things that we sometimes associate with the moon card, and then uh, also in these reflected in probably the nine of cups, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. So the 12th house is also the place of isolation. It's where we go to retire from the world. Monasteries and mental hospitals, for example, belong to this house. Quiet, solitude, places where we just go to escape. It's the, uh, the last house of the zodiac, where we go to dissolve into nothingness. So now we're going to keep all of this in mind as we look at the next three cards and the next three images. And we're going to begin with the Eight of Cups. So we're going to keep Neptune as the ruler and Pisces, the moon card, here. 
And we have the next card here. The visitor is Saturn. Saturn, as we know, is the world card, which also comes along with the devil card, which is Capricorn, the sign that Saturn rules. So from everything we already know about Saturn, we know that it brings a very different energy from Neptune and both Neptune and Jupiter. And I'm going to leave Jupiter here too since it is a traditional ruler. So in this Deccan, we have Saturn, which gives us a very, very different energy. Saturn can be a challenging energy, as we know already. And it brings with it limitations, attachments, setbacks, a sense of loss, regret, satisfaction, and abandonment. So this is just a review, because we talked about Saturn before, just earlier. And we also said that if we learn how to work with Saturn's energy, it can be very rewarding. We can manifest things in the physical world with discipline, commitment, hard work, commitment. Corinne Kenner in Terran Astrology says about this card, the Golden Dawn designers of this card called Saturn in Pisces the Lord of Abandoned Success because it illustrates the act of deserting a dream. In a tarot reading, the Eight of Cups often represents regrets, abandonment, or a spiritual quest for completion and fulfillment. Uh, I like how she says the spiritual quest for completion, because this brings the world card in it, of course, blended with that Pisces energy, the need for spirituality, for spiritual quest. And then the act of deserting a dream, as she says, is I think a lovely delineation of Saturn in Pisces, of course, Saturn being abandonment, P Pisces being the dreamer. Of course, Saturn represents many, many keywords besides abandonment, as we know. Uh, but when we delineate, we can just draw on what we see fits into this picture. What, what does Saturn represent? What does Pisces represent? And how does that reflect it in the image? That's the way I'm doing I'm going about this. And with this card in particular, we have a strong sense of the presence of the imagery, just the imagery of the moon that we see here, the moon glowing in the sky at night. It's the presence of the moon that comes through here. So that's Pisces and the moon card reflected in here, just visually. And I know that um, there are many, many different uh, artistic representations of this card, the Eight of Cups, and the moon is always there. It's almost always there. So that gives me kind of that, that backdrop of Pisces and the moon card right here. And I'm going to read you again from uh, Jessa Crispin's The Creative Tarot. She just points to the presence of Saturn here when she says, The missing cup, the missing cup right here, the missing cup represents our dissatisfaction. There is something missing for us and the situation, some emotional connection, and we have to leave what we have to go searching for what we lack. Sometimes we have to abandon work when it is no longer satisfying to us. So I think this is so, it's so beautiful because, you know, I find these quotes and they, these um, guidebooks never really mention astrology per se, but the language is very much linked to the astrological um, symbolism, right? We have here dissatisfaction, um, the missing cup representing that, and something missing, a lack, uh, leaving to go for what we lack, in, lack of emotional connection being the water sign of Pisces. So she says something is missing, some emotional connection. And Pisces being a, a water sign, but of course one of the most sensitive water signs, it really needs to connect on a deep emotional level and so um, when Crispa says here, Jessa Crispin says, we have to sometimes abandon the work. That's very interesting also because it relates to Saturn, not only in terms of abandonment, but Saturn rules the 10th house, as we've seen earlier on. And the 10th house is the house of careers and worldly material success, where we are out there in the world. So again, I'm always bringing in these quotes from different guidebooks just to show how astrologically these things are interwoven into the, what we are familiar with already. 
So for example, in the uh, Complete Guide to the Tarot by Eden Gray, which is a classic, she says, the seeker may desire to leave material success for something higher. Success abandoned. Disappointment in love. And remember that Pisces is highly idealistic and highly romantic. And Saturn may bring disappointments in love, which can be quite painful for Pisces, who very much needs to connect on a deep emotional level. And if you remember from the Three of Swords, that was Saturn in Libra, bringing emo emotional disappointments as well, and some conflict in relationships. So as you can see, there are many different possibilities for delineation in one planetary placement, of course, and similarly with tarot, many different possibilities for interpretation within one image. Here the man is leaving behind maybe a relationship. Maybe he's leaving behind material success for higher spiritual values. He could be going on a spiritual journey, fulfilling a dream, or alternatively abandoning a dream. These are all possibilities. And I'm here to present you with possibilities. So the next card is Nine of Cups. So we're going to take this away. We have Nine of Cups. Interesting one to look at. Usually seen in a very, very positive light. But we're going to look at it, the Nine and the Ten of Cups, slightly um, differently today. And here we have Jupiter in Pisces. So we have our, our visitor is actually Jupiter, which is uh, a co-ruler of Pisces. And we saw that Jupiter rules Sagittarius, the temperance card. So here we have ruler of Sagittarius and Pisces, Jupiter. So being the ruler of Pisces, the benevolent Jupiter is very, very powerful here, bringing good luck and fortune to this Deccan. In traditional astrology, actually, when Jupiter come, uh, sits in the birth chart of somebody in the 12th house, so if you have uh, Jupiter in the 12th house, in traditional astrology, the ancients believed that this was a, a good luck placement, like a lucky placement that you always had a, um, the guardian angel looking out for you. So I think the keywords that we have associated with this card, such as success and happiness, are just some of the main keywords where we know that this card has this reputation for being called the, the, the wish card, wishes fulfilled. And I think this is, of course, the positive take on this particular placement. But we know that things are never 100% completely black and white. So even though we have Jupiter here, of course, it comes with its own challenges as well. Um, to me, the way I see tarot and the way I view astrological interpretations, astrological placements, there's never really this 100% uh, positive or 100% negative thing. There's always something um, in between, like the, between the positive and negative, between the black and white, there's a lot more to see. And one of the shadows, shadow aspects of Jupiter is its, its uh, potential or propensity for overindulgence. And of course, we talked about the temperance card being a nice reminder for the, the importance of moderation and balance for both for Jupiter and also for the sign Sagittarius. And the expanse of Jupiter, it exaggerates, it enlarges anything it touches. Any planet that comes into contact with Jupiter, whatever the planet represents, will expand and grow. So we know that. And Jupiter is the planet of growth and prosperity. So this can be really great in some cases, but maybe not so great in some other cases. So for example, if we were looking at medical astrology, in medical terms, um, we're looking at the growth of a tumor, it's not necessarily a good thing, right? We don't want a tumor to grow. Uh, so Jupiter is known to be um, the one that exaggerates and expands. So that's that's a good thing. It can bring good luck, good fortune. But in some cases, it you know it needs to be tempered. It needs moderation. Jupiter is also known to be very arrogant. He's an arrogant god. So we are warned in this card to watch out for too much pride. Maybe in this case, this man with his arms crossed in this position, 
might be overly proud of his successes. He's got all his cups arranged. He's very proud of them. And he's just, you know, um, not really approachable. Very, very proud with his arms in this position. That's how you can also interpret it. I mean, that's just one way. Um, so we stated earlier on, briefly, that Pisces is prone to addictions. And also Jupiter can be excessive and uh, prone to addictions. Gambling and over drinking are Jupiter's domain. In the sign of Pisces, Jupiter can be prone to alcoholism, inflation, and just basically excess. So we can have the more spiritual um, side of Jupiter and Pisces with satisfaction, fulfillment, good luck, fortune, happiness, all of that. And then we can also have the darker side that we just talked about. And now I want to read you uh, an excerpt just from 36 Faces by Austin Kapok, the book that I've referred to along in this series. And I think this will give us a deeper look into the meaning of the card. It's kind of a longer paragraph, but I thought it was really interesting, so I will read it for you. So he says, the full name for this card, according to Book T, is The Lord of Material Happiness. For the art of establishing harmony between the inner and the outer is rarely without material rewards. The rich and satisfied looking man pictured on the Rider Waits Nine of Cups makes this clear. The images of wealth and influence associated with this Deccan may not be inaccurate, but they miss the essence of what occurs in this space, a product rather than a process. The ability to attain harmonious relationship between the material and the spiritual layers of life is the art of following the Tao itself, exemplified in the iconography of the Taoist immortals, at play in the material world but not beholden to it. Indeed, several traditional images suggest that the material riches are the product of a spiritual labor. The Picatrix pictures, open quote, a man upside down with his head below and his feet raised up. This inversion, pictured in most versions of the hangman card of the tarot, signifies that the material and spiritual priorities have been inverted and that the figure is grounded in the invisible rather than upon the earth. Yet the inverted figure offers sustenance, proving that, his, that this strange act is not futile, but fruitful. The harmonious interpretation of realms is the essential formula of this Deccan. At its fruit is satisfaction, which is called happiness. And I had to read you that because I feel like it's very complete, really builds a picture of this card for me. And so I think we can end this discussion here on the Nine of Cups and move on to the next card, the Ten of Cups. So I'm going to keep Jupiter here. And we have the Ten of Cups, finally with our visitor Mars here. Wow, so this is going to be interesting. This is actually, so the last card in the Minor Arcana, we finally, it's the last card and I'm going to spend a little more time on this card because I have a lot to say about it. It's the typical happy card of the tarot and then we have Mars here. So I think it's just, it's more than just what we see. It's more than what this picture-perfect uh, rainbow in the sky shows us. So with Mars, the god of war and destruction, the tower card, let's see if there's anything lurking beneath the surface of the Pisces water here with the Ten of Cups that we normally associate with everything great. So usually what we read about this card in tarot literature is very picture perfect, right? Um, keywords like family harmony, success, happiness, emotional harmony, so all that kind of stuff, right? And um, well, because after all, this is supposed to be the happiest card in tarot. 
Um, here, for example, is what Kim Hudgens says in the complete guide to the Tarot Illuminati. She says, there's nothing wrong with this scene. Things really couldn't get any better. All is right with the world. However, if we look at this card astrologically, things might not always be as they seem or as they appear. First of all, we're talking about Mars here in a mutable water sign. Very, very different kind of energies. Um, Mars being the fiery planet, the god of war, of action, of movement. And then in traditional medical astrology, it's uh, Mars is hot and dry by temperament, just like fire itself. It's very opposite energy to Pisces, which is ruled by Neptune. It's very uh, kind of mm, spiritual planet of, well, it's not always spiritual, but it's, it's a very elusive planet, as we said, and it's the watery, it's very, it's a w watery world of the imagination of Pisces, very sensitive, and so we have a mix of fire in a sensitive wire sign of Pisces. So how does the fiery god of war, which in traditional me medical, oh, sorry, the traditional um, astrology is referred to as a malefic, malefic Mars. How does that give us such a beautiful, dreamy landscape here in this card? And we said that Neptune, as a ruler of Pisces, is very elusive. So this landscape, could it be an illusion? And the word dreamy, that's of course very Piscean. Pisces is the dreamer of the zodiac. When I first looked at this card years ago, I was when I was studying tarot and astrology, at first I couldn't understand how this happy family image could fit into Mars in Pisces. But then, after having a little think about it, I realized, well, of course, Pisces can be highly idealistic and prone to fantasy and illusion, and especially with this mixture of Mars here, Mars bringing in an intense energy to this Deccan, Perhaps the idealistic, elusive side of Pisces might be coming through a little bit. So even though everything looks picture perfect, to me, there's always been a little bit of an underlying sense of suspicion about this card. Now let me read you a couple of lines from Tarot and Astrology by Corinne Kenner. Obviously, she says, the family on the card is idealized. Pisces has a tendency to deny reality. And in the 12th house of secrets and mystery, Pisces won't just deny unhappy memories, it will suppress them, forget them, lock them away like monsters in the closet. The minor arcana cards of Pisces are connected to the moon and the hanged man. Both contribute to the dreamlike nature of this card, as memories, dreams, reflections lend an air of unreality to the image. I thought that was beautiful. And then Anthony Lewis in his book, The Journey of the Tarot Fool Around the Zodiac, warns us about the pitfalls of this card. He says, be mindful, though, that the malefic Mars never completely loses his sting. In this card, he carries with it a warning that bliss cannot last forever. And I think that's nice because that's just like a, a side warning. You know, everything is, might be great, but just, you know, don't lose yourself there. Don't lose sight of reality. It might not last forever. So this idea of illusion becomes important for me when looking at this card and Mars and Pisces. And, it, and just um, as an interesting side note, the great illusionist David Copperfield, by the way, has Mars and Pisces in his birth chart. I thought that was interesting. When I found that out, I thought about this card. Um, I also want to mention briefly here that the traditional ruler of Pisces, which is Jupiter, the Wheel of Fortune, is known to be, as we said, the planet of, planet of luck and fortune, expansion and growth. And of course, this could give us a more positive, quote unquote, take on this card. So I think that this is a great example of how tarot images are not necessarily read as black and white, positive or negative, just like in astrology where every planet in a sign has numerous ways of expressing itself. So the tower card is a very powerful card. And then the moon card is not always the easiest energy. It's not always the easiest card in tarot either. Combined with the hangman, 
we have a complex blend of energies here. So this idealistic image of the perfect family and rainbows in the clear sky, how realistic is this? This is just something to consider. There are, uh, from what I found, very few books that I've come across throughout my years of working with tarot which actually do consider the shadow aspect of this card. Two of them I just mentioned, I read you those two quotes which are directly of course related to astrological correspondences and then there's a third one which is by the way one of my favorite guidebooks and that's the Herbal Tarot Guidebook and I absolutely love this book because it really does help to understand the astrological correspondences in a, in a very subtle ways in, term, in terms of what plants and herbs correspond to the card so that kind of helps me to associate astrologically as well because of course plants refer uh, correspond to planets in medical astrology. So I'm going to end this discussion of this card by reading you just a few lines from this lovely little book that I found was helpful. Uh, and then and then that's it and we're gonna just end it here with the minor arcana. So in the herbal uh, tarot the the ten of cups is associated with marijuana the plant, the marijuana plant and it talks about the importance of joy and blissful experiences and experiencing having spiritual blissful experiences so i'm just going to read you this one little paragraph here so here is by the way the ten of cups from the herbal tarot beautiful card beautiful deck very colorful and i've learned so much working with it and if you're like me if you love herbs and plants and if you want to learn about their properties and also learn about their correspondences astrologically and to tarot you will love the guidebook to this deck so i'm going to read you because we're in the last card here so i'm going to take some time and read you this uh marijuana cannabis sativa mars and pisces ten of cups the ten of cups are precariously balanced as an inverted triangle on an unstable watery foundation here is talking about this arrangement and I like that it says unstable watery foundation so it's sort of referring to this Pisces and Neptune energy. Around and behind clouds and a rainbow further signify passing illusions. This may be a time for celebrating the rewards of life but do not lose yourself in the celebration to the point of uncertain intoxication. Learn to maintain inner equilibrium just as in an old Chinese text states in their pleasures and joys, they were dignified and tranquil. In this way, one can see and be conscious of the energies that are connected to the emotion of joy. We can learn life's lessons through joyfulness and bliss, and not, as it is often thought, only through pain and grief. Be open for new insights and fresh states of awareness, but don't get lost in the pie-in-the-sky syndrome. Be suspicious of the possibility of ungrounded delusions ungrounded delusions i like that because that's very much like what the energy of mars might bring to pisces in combination with neptune for this card so it's like a little warning there to watch out for and so this concludes my minor arcana series my actually so far we've covered major arcana and my minor, minor arcana so that's it if you have been with me up until this point i want to send you a huge congratulations thank you for being here you've done so much i'm very proud of you this has been a long journey thank you for sticking through it with me i will be doing the court cards next uh i can't really say when because this is a very time consuming process for me but uh, and, I, and i love it and i've learned a lot from it but i do want to make sure that i deliver this material as as accurately and as best to my knowledge as I can. So I'm going to take my time with the court cards, but I, I, I've I learned so much um, from astrology in, when it comes to court cards. Really, I don't think I could have understood the court cards easily if it wasn't for astrology. So I want to share that with you because I want to share uh, my what what has helped me and perhaps it will help some other people out there as well. So I hope that so far this video series has been engaging and helpful and useful and interesting. 
As always, know that I really appreciate your comments, so please share them with me. And thank you again so much for being here. As always, I'm sending you so much love and many blessings, and I can't wait to see you again in the next video. Bye, everybody. Ask me if you have any questions down below. Bye.